Okay, open your Bibles. To the second epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. <clears throat> chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We've been taking a look at this chapter the last few weeks on this section of the last day series where we, are, where we are now dealing with the false prophet which is Muhammad the Muhammad of Islam and we've been looking at these verses and I told you we're going to peel this back layer by layer not just Muhammad's life I'm going to bring things to the forefront about Muhammad that even the most devout Muslims don't know anything about. It has been successively hidden, kept as a secret. See, the truth shall set you free. But if you're successful in hiding that truth, you're going to stay in bondage. And they have had a lot of practice, about 1,300 years of practice, how to keep it a secret. Well, the secret's out. And more and more people, preachers and pastors, that have the guts to preach the truth, no matter what, We'll get this message out worldwide. There's a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but there is starting to come to the forefront more and more people taking a look at Islam as possibly being the eighth beast. But they only touch on it. I really don't believe they give enough information for people to be convinced to change their eschatological view of the end times and what led up to these particular times. And that's why it's taken a while to get through the series and we're not even close to even, probably even being halfway. There's that much. That needs to be understood. Daniel had questions and it was not to be revealed. Well, the time is now. The time has been around for about 60 some years. There's no excuse since 1967 for any preacher not to realize what the time they are in. But established Christianity has been successful in planning a doctrinal theory or theories that has just brought confusion not clarity to the subject well that's why this ministry exists and we've been taking a look at Muhammad the false prophet and what the second epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians has to say about it now chapter 2 everyone mostly that preaches on the last days preaches this is the future Antichrist. Of course, they can't base that Antichrist in anything unless they fabricate some story to make it sound plausible. They don't give you no verifiable evidence. I'm not going to preach on this tonight. But you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. After, in verse 10, we read about the deceit and the deceivableness of the unrighteous caused by this false prophet, as I preach, because they would not receive the love and they have no love of the truth. What truth? The truth that can save them. It goes on to read in verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 
Now, you could take this verse and generally apply it to other topics if you want to. I don't even have a problem if you stay somewhat in context of what the meaning of this verse is. But when it comes to referring to what the context is of this particular verse in this particular chapter with the information previously given in the previous ten verses, what is this saying? I want you to start really thinking hard. That's why this ministry exists. To blow out your cobwebs. To get those brain cells working again. To ask questions, which hopefully will lead to verification of answers throughout God's book. But I want you to stop, and when the message is over, and we go to a song, I'd like you to reply. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Of course, we all accept that. Because it was God who hardened Pharaoh's heart in the Old Testament with Moses. That was on a single basis, one-to-one -one situation with God and Pharaoh. Can that happen? Obviously it can. It happened in the Old Testament. Can it happen now? Sure, if that's what the direction God wants to take. But is that what this verse is saying? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Of course, the lie is that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. I've gone through these verses before. Just in our present time, that's about 2 billion people. Actually, maybe more than that. God's going to send a delusion, which I'll get into what all this means probably next time. I just want to plant the seed. Is God going to send such a strong delusion? Now, Islam has been around for 1,300 years, just presently over, over 2 billion Muslims today. So how many existed over the last 1,300 years? 3 billion, 4 billion, 5 billion? God is purposely sending a delusion that these people should believe a lie? Is that what you were led to believe? Like I said, people use these verses, and I have, in other context. But in context, without drifting to any other topic, is that what it's saying? Did you ever stop to ask? Have you read anywhere anybody asking? Have you ever seen concern by any preacher or pastor? Why would God allow this to happen? I want you to really think about it. Is that what this verse is saying? Now, knowing what your response is going to be, because you already know my style of teaching, you know this is going to lead to somewhere else, so you're going to be afraid to answer it, at least honestly with me, because your first answer, if you're honest with yourself, if you have the guts to communicate that to me, yeah, God's the one who's going to send it. That's what you believe. Then next time, probably next time, don't miss the next teaching session in this series because more than likely, I will deal with that. Now, for tonight's message, now I dangle you with that,
Let's move on to chapter 2, the beginning of the chapter. And then we'll read a little bit more about Muhammad if I have time. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've said, with respect. A more correct translation should be written down in your margin, in your Bible. Now we beseech you, brethren, with respect to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken. I told you this. The word here is the word that was used when describing ships being tossed around in a storm. In mind, mental instability, or be troubled or agitated, neither by spirit, someone having the spirit of prophecy, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Has come and is present is a better translation. Yes, there's another one they're expecting. They're, they're expecting. But Paul was de dealing with something else. And it goes on to say, Let no man deceive you by any means in any manner. For except their coming of falling away. And I've told you to write this in the margins. A rebellion and departure. Those who reject Christ. Those who reject Christ. Let no man deceive you in any manner, for except their coming of falling away first, and that man of sin, that man of sin, be revealed. So in Paul's day, it was not revealed yet, but Paul had inside information. He didn't know what his name, at least we don't have no clue that he knew his name would be Muhammad. He would create Islam. But he knew that a man of sin was going to be revealed. But first, there'll be a falling away. And that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. And that falling away is a rebellion and departure. Those rejecting Christ. And then we already covered verse 4 in two parts. Tonight will be the third part. Another layer. In this layer, I think, hopefully, because I don't have another layer after this one for this particular verse, will help you see once and for all why this is referring to Islam, Muhammad, individuals that received the message, the spiritual temple, and the heathen temple, the Dome of the Rock. Well, why not the one in Mecca? Because we're dealing with prophecy that relates to Israel. Who opposes and exalts himself all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God is in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, I've told you who opposed it, putting something else in place, all that is worship, idolatrous images, and the, spiritual, and, the, and the temple could be spiritual. But I'm going to add something else tonight. It also could be something else. Pointing out himself that he is God. Who is God? Who is God? And what is God? Now, God, the word is, is theos in the New Testament. Theos, T-H-E-O-S. It's used different ways. As a title of God with a definite article in the Greek, and then other ways also. But tonight, I want to peel away at this verse so you can know once and for all why you believe without any doubt what verse 3 this is referring to, this man of sin, this son of perdition, and what he would accomplish, which you know if you're living in today's times and heard of Islam, what was produced from this individual. And we already start covering it slowly, but we'll get to it. God willing, God willing we'll even get further tonight. So now I want to go to the board, and I want to break this down.
I'm just going to read it to you. Let me get out of the way so you can pick up the whole. Let me just get my pointer. Let me read it to you once through. If you're going to break it down and try to put it in an English language, this is how it would read. And then it will make it more readable as we would read it in the English language to make some type of sense of what I put on the board here. Verse 4. Now this is the whole verse in its entirety. From who, and if you read from the King James, the first word in verse 4, to God being the last word. Everything is covered here in this, on the board concerning this verse. Got it? That puts something else in place. Let's read it from verse 3, and then we'll pick, the, pick it up from, on verse 4. Let's read the, the end of verse 3. First, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That puts something in place, speaking of the man of perdition, and lift it up before each to teach God, not capitalized by the way, rather than idolatrous images, so that he, the heathen or spiritual temple, this God to sit down to declare or prove, either word is fine there, himself to be God. Now, I want you to write this down. This is going to be very important as I start pointing out what this verse is referring to. Now, in verse 3, we see that man of sin be revealed, a rebellion departure, because he would definitely reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and he would be the son of perdition. Correct? And the very next word is that put who? This man of sin. This man of sin would put something else in place. What did he put in place that was something totally different? The Quran, the Quran, which he, according to him, received the information to put that something in place by the angel Gabriel. So that medicine that put something else in place, that something else being the Quran, and lifted up before each, and lifted up. Lifting up something above everything else. So he lifted up the Quran above everything else to teach God. Now, God is Theos. Oh, well, that is talking about God Almighty. That's the error. That's the error that Christians make. Even scholars. They want to include Theos as only God, the God of the faith that we believe in, the Christian faith. No other God. But the only problem is, now I'm going to go sit down again and come back to me because I want to point something out. And I'll get back to the board in a minute. Come back to me. You go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4. Verse. Let's just start with verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced and hidden things of dishonesty, or of shame, literally, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. That's why I take everything that I present to you very seriously. I don't want to bring shame to the word of God. How dare anyone even try, most of the time because of their laziness and lack of research. They've been brainwashed to repeat everything that's been repeated for the last 200 years, especially on this topic. 
not walking craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every conscience in the sight of God. Too many unconsciousness preachers in the sight of God today in Christianity. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid, hid to them that are lost. I've had you circle this word before, hid. It's the kind of the word that's used in the Greek that describes the bark that covers what's under the bark. You don't see, unless you cut the tree in half or a branch breaks off, what's underneath that bark. That's what it's describing here. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, the God, there would be ho theos. Ho theos. H O, second word, T H E O S. Ho theos. See, the problem is, you need to, you need to be really ready because I'm going to go back and forth quite a bit. Ho theos. That's not what's being used here. This is something totally unrelated, but ho theos. Ho theos is usually translated the God. And the Christian error is, is claiming that every time you see ho theos, the God or the Almighty God is being referred to. That's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true, because ho can mean the, but it could mean this, that, and so forth. It has other meanings behind it, definitions that goes with this particular Greek word that's used, ho theos. Now, on two occasions, you go, I'm going to sit down again. On two occasions, including this verse here in verse 4, in whom, let's start with verse 3 again, but if our God be hid, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. How and why? In whom the God, there be, the God would be, Hotheos, obviously not referring to the Almighty God. Why? Because it clearly states, in whom the God of who? Of this world. That's not the Almighty God. So I'm sorry, friends, unless you want to change the language completely that's being used in, in this verse, and then again in 2 Thessalonians verse 4 when we get to it, the two references that I'm giving to you tonight, now, I do agree. Just about every other time, hotheos means something else. It's talking about the God, my God. I wrote down some verses. For instance, you go to, you might want to write this down because I'm not going to go to them. I have it written down already. Hotheos, in John, I think it's in John 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said to them, My Lord and my God, my God, Hotheos. So the word there for ho is my. You move along, you see in John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. So my, again, is used in the place of ho for our English word. You move down to Matthew 4.10. You shall worship the Lord ho theos. There it's your God. So it's not my, but it's your. You go to Matthew 22.37. Jesus said to him, Ye shall love the Lord ho theos, your God. Matthew... That was Matthew 4.10. Matthew 22, 37 is, And you shall love the Lord, Hotheos, your God. You get it, folks? A few more. Hebrews 12.29, For also, here is, Hotheos is a consuming fire, or our God. So we have my, we have your, now we have our. But my God, Hotheos, shall supply all your need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. There is my God used again. And I could give you, because there's many, where it gives you a title of the God, my God, your God, our God. And in here, in a different way, 
It's hotheos. But it's not talking about the God. Because theos on its own, I'm going to the book, theos on its own means just God. It could be referring to the God that we worship, the God Almighty. But usually when that happens, there's a hoe in front of it to give it its title. But here it's, and lifted up before each to teach God, just Theos. And you look in classical literature of, in the Greek, Theos is used to describe pagan gods. So the Greek word Theos does not just mean the God, the Almighty God referring to the God of creation, the God whom we worship, but it could also refer to pagan gods. It can be referring to Satan, as we see here in 2 Corinthians, verse 4, in whom the God, the Hotheos of this world, speaking of Satan himself, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto him. Should shine unto unto him you get it satan in i'm getting all tangled up in my wires here satan in verse four is the whole theos but in this case in an evil aspect not in the the god of creation or jesus christ as the son of god no it's Ho, it, there's no ho, it's just God here. It's just theos. So it's not talking about the God, the God of creation. And here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it's talking about the God, but it's not the God of the, the, the creation, not the God of salvation. This is just the God of the world. The world being planet Earth, in this case. Who has blinded the minds? Of who? Of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan's putting the blinders up so they don't see, hear, perceive the message of grace, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be rescued, to be saved, to be a disciple of Christ. Got it? Now, with that, let's continue with this verse. Back to... 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that, put, that would put something else in place, <clears throat> that something, as we know now, is the Quran, and lift it up. What did he lift up? He lifted up the Quran before each, anyone that would listen to him at that time. And there were takers to teach, and, they st and there still are people that are, listening to it now, more now than ever, to teach God feels, not the God, because there is no ho, rather than idolatrous images. Well, what's so bad about that? At least he's eliminating the idolatrous images. Well, what big deal? We already covered that in <clears throat> around Mecca, the Saudi Arabian area, there was at least 300 <clears throat> gods that they were worshiping. They had one for every day of the week. So he, as we already covered, eliminated all those gods. He even eliminated the daughters of Allah down to one god, and that god would be Allah. So, and lifted up before each to teach God or Allah rather than idolatrous images. All the 360 plus Idolatrous images and false worship that was being taught and practiced by the population of his era. Area, excuse me. Okay, got it? Let's cover it again. That put something else in place and lifted up the Quran before each to teach. Now, the Quran was established afterwards. All Muhammad had before his death was. His teachings. Now, the Quran was established after he died based on people's memories of what he said, what he taught, and lifted up before each to teach Allah 
theos in this case, but we know what it is now, so we could insert now because it is revealed to us. We're not living in Paul's day, rather than the adulterous images. We already covered that. That should be second nature to you now, understanding that this is what Muhammad was dealing with. He reduced it down to this. And the reason why he got away with it, because Allah, amongst his 360 gods, was, let's just call it the main god of the group. So was this accepted. Got it? Now let's read the verse again. That put something else in place and lifted up before each to teach Allah rather than idolatrous images. Now, if that doesn't describe Muhammad and what he was able to accomplish up to this point, then what does? Show it to me. Show it to me. Well, it's the future Antichrist. That's what it's going to do. Where's your evidence of that fact? Where do you get that from? Prove it. I preach the verifiable word of God, not silly fantasy. <coughs> okay, let's continue. Allah, rather than idolatrous images, so that he, I'm just giving it to you literally now, how it should read. I'm going to add something to make it easier for understanding, for us to understand the English language. So that he, the heathen or spiritual temple. Now let's add something here. So that he caused the heathen, this would be, since we're talking about end times, the area that would affect Israel, the Dome of the Rock, the abomination of desolation, but you can even apply it down where, down where the Kabbalah is. You could go down to Mecca and other religious sites and mosques of importance in Islam that people make their pilgrimage pilgrimage to on a yearly basis but for the sake of staying within scripture and what we're referring to in the last days and how it affects Israel it's none other than the Dome of the Rock got it so that he calls the heathen temple the, the temple that were made by hands of Islamic followers based on Muhammad's teachings that created the Quran after his death and then we know in 688 A.D., the Dome of the Rock began being built. But this word here, before temple in the Greek, could also have a spiritual aspect, which I told you last week. Because the Quran, Islam, even though this is the physical aspect of it, what you can see with your eyes, this what affects your mind. So that he caused not only your mind, but what you perceive with your own eyes as a place of worship, in this case called the temple, this God, Theos again. But, oh, hang, hang on a minute. I'm misspelling it. Now I really messed up my board. Theos. But there's something else about this. This here is Ho. Aha! Here's a simple, simple sec, second example we have in your scripture when it's referring to Ho Theos outside of Ho Theos concerning the Almighty God or the Almighty Son of God. So that he caused the heathen, the dome of the rock, or because we now know because we have the insight to verify it or the spiritual, what takes an effect in man's minds and hearts, temple, because it could be a spiritual temple, it could also be a physical temple, Hotheus, this God, to sit down to declare or prove himself. Who's himself here? This God. Who's this God? Allah. To be God. Once again, Theos. You got it, folks? You got it? So let's read it again. Let's start with verse 3. Let no man deceive you in any manner. 
For except there come a falling away, a rebellion, a departure, those rejecting, rejecting Jesus Christ first, and that man of sin be revealed. Oh, heck, there's been a re rejection of Jesus Christ in great numbers. After 95 AD, no matter what you have read, the church start falling apart. Why? In most cases, because of pagan practices that were reintroduced back in the church. Now, there's surviving groups, and there's even martyrs that gave up their life for the cause of Christ that would not de deny. And those are the reasons why Christianity survived. But in many occasions, it looked like it was going to be exterminated, but it wasn't. It hung on. That's only going to be... Uh, You only can come to the conclusion that through the Holy Spirit and through a few, it was able to live on for our sake, for the sake of all others that came before us in these 2,000 past years. That put something else in place after the son of perdition was revealed. Paul didn't know when he was going to be revealed. All he knew that he would be revealed that put something in place, and he would come. Then this man of sin would put something in place. He put the Quran, as I stated before, in place. Not before he died, but his followers after he died. But he laid enough principles, which he declared as the truth concerning Allah being only the God. And it took, a, it took hold, just as it was prophesied it would. It created the seventh beast and eventually the eighth beast. He put something else in his place and lifted up what? The Quran before, or the teachings of, which eventually lead to the Quran, before each to teach God, Theos, could it also mean pagan God, we know now, Allah, rather than idolatrous images, rather than having 360 gods, and since Allah was one of the main gods anyway, why not just make him the main God and eliminate the 360? So that he caused the heathen and spiritual temple, the Dome of the Rock, and how it affects individual lives, this God, Hotheos, not in a good way, but in an evil way, Hotheos is used, to sit down where? This God that sits down in the Dome of the Rock to prove himself, Allah, to be Theos, God or Allah again, and according to Islam, the only God. Never had the Son of God. God has no children. There's no Holy Spirit. There's no the only begotten Son of God. It declares that in the Dome of the Rock. It declares that in the Quran. It declares that in many other teachings. Outside the Quran, <clears throat> by Imams throughout their history, this is how this verse, and I challenge anyone that will spend at least 12 hours analyzing all the material that's out there in classical Greek literature to tell me I'm wrong. If you have an open mind and an open heart, knowing now which Daniel or even Paul couldn't see because the time was not yet for it to be unveiled, that's why I come against the doctrines that were established that created a lot of these Christian science fiction theories over 200 years ago. Satan got a jump. Satan got a jump because he knew someday this, all of this would be declared and the truth would be revealed. This is the truth. Anybody who spends enough time looking at it would come to that realization. It depends how hard-headed what they spend tens of thousands of dollars of education, <clears throat> which by the way was probably a waste of your money, and there's too much of a wall that's been built up to accept anything besides what Thus saith my professor at theological, theolo the theological school <coughs> that you went to. 
I need to get my some, some water. <coughs> Keep it on the board while I clear my voice up. <coughs> All those wasted dollars <coughs> to be brainwashed as robots professing silly fantasy theories that started by a silly little girl and others that makes no complete sense that can't be backed up in God's word unless more fantasy is fabricated and they say well this is what the scripture says no it does not there is not a Bible you can buy that surrounds these verses that won't give you their silly interpretation from verse 1 all the way to verse 12. <clears throat> that doesn't depend on the Christian science fiction theories. Which leads me to the question, after understanding this, I'm not going to wait till next week. And I'm going to go through verse 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and 10. Let me just pick up at 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, or whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and I've told you before, prodigies of falsehood, and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness unto or in them that perish. I'll just read you, and I'll fill in more gaps at a later time. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, verse 11. And for this cause, God. No definite article used again. But God, in this case, once again, God, which we already had the definition in prior verses, meaning Allah, once understood, shall send them right in your margins. Send. I'm going back to my chair, driving the camera people nuts. And for this cause, God shall send, right in your margins, insert a thing into another, literally, them strong delusion. You mean God the Almighty? The Hotheos did that? No. Just God, Theos, shall send, insert a thing into another. What thing? The Quranic beliefs created by Muhammad that them strong delusion. What is delusion here? Write this down. A powerful working of error that leads to deceit and fraud. It's one of those English words that in the Greek, once understood how it's used in the Greek, in communication of the Greek language, as one would talk in the Greek and communicate what it's trying to reveal here, it is a powerful working of error which leads to deceit and fraud. Why would God, the Almighty, who sent His only begotten Son, who sent his only begotten son to die for this world, deliberately send, insert something into another. That means he would have to put the gospel record in the back seat in these people's minds on purpose, let's just put it that way, and insert something else which leads to destruction because it's full of deceit and fraud. It's full and powerful in its communication of spiritual error that leads man down to spiritual destruction. Why would God do that? That's not the God that I know. <clears throat> Could he? Sure. 
outside on an individual basis, we're talking about billions on top of the billions on top of the billions, folks. There's no record of him doing that. There's no record of him doing that. Prove it to me. That they should believe a lie. They should believe a lie. Literally, they, that they should pisteo, have trust and confidence in a lie. What kind of lie? I've been there before. Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Since we're speaking about lies, let's look at a liar. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. And whoever denied the Son, the same had not the Father, but he that acknowledged the Son had the Father also. Hmm. Well, let's read it again. I'll even start one verse sooner. In verse 21. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. So basically, anyone that denies Jesus Christ, why he came, who he was, what he did, and he's going to come back again, is denying the Father and the Son. And if he says anything else, he's declared a liar. He's professing a lie. <clears throat> Islam in the Dome of the Rock, declares that. The Quran declares that. Oh, they'll say Jesus is the, a good prophet, and he'll come back too, and he'll serve Muhammad. But they declare that God had no son. Or there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as the Trinity. They go out of their way to make that point. They're the lie. They're the liars. Back to 2 Thessalonians. And for this cause, God feels. Not the God, the Almighty God. The God of this world. Through Muhammad. Creating a Allah as now, in their perception, the God. And what they're trying to convince this world that's the only God. For this cause shall for this cause Theos shall send them strong delusion, a powerful working error, deceit and fraud, that they should believe a lie. They shall believe that God is doesn't have a son. Now would God do that? I asked that question at the beginning of this message. Would God do that? Would God cast away billions and billions of people on purpose, knowing that his son came to die for all? Not all will see the son, unfortunately, the only begotten son, as the savior of this world. It's to their loss. It's to their destruction. But the question is, does God purposely do that Purposely convince people a lie is that God's nature in Scripture. Purposely convince people a lie, a powerful working of error that's full of deceit and fraud. Does that sound like God? The God, Hotheos, the creator, the almighty God, the one that has the only begotten son that came and died to rescue this world and rose again and is going to come back? No! I'm sorry, you Christian science fiction people and <clears throat> whatever. That's not what this is referring to. And you would never know that, go back to the board, unless you understood this verse, which kind of gives you the background about Theos and Ho Theos, in this case, this God to sit down to prove himself what he was teaching about Allah to be God. 
You can never understand verse 11 unless you had a clear definition after all the layer peeling what the Word of God is referring to here. You got it, folks? I don't think I want to overwhelm you, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. Now, well, I'm going to go on to verse 12. Come back to me. That they all might be damned. God's doing this in the Christian sense, the way it's understood. The God, the one that we worship, going to send this powerful working heir of deceit and fraud that, we would have that people would have trust and confidence in the lie that would be created. Not the God I serve. Allah, yes. Not the God I serve. Not the Christ I'm a disciple of. That they all might be damned. Why send his son then in the first place? Who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This Theos, in verse 11, will set up his powerful delusion, working a bear of deceit and fraud, so people who have trust and confidence in the lie that was created. That puts something else in place. Part of verse 4. That they all might be damned. Whoever would believe this lie, who believe not the truth. What truth? How many times do we have to go over and over? The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the rescuer of mankind, our Savior, our Messiah. He died, he rose, he's coming back again. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, most of the people that listen to me will fall into 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath in the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification and setting apart of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel, not the lie, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, most of the people that listen to me are in this camp. But there's plenty of Christians are confused because they don't understand the basic communication what Paul was communicating because even Paul didn't reveal it because it didn't happen yet. But now we know. Now we know how to look for it. Now we know once we peel it away layer by layer what Paul was referring to. We have the information. There is no excuse for any preacher to look into and do the research if you don't want to believe me. You'll come out every time scratching your head and say, how did I fall for that nonsense? About verse 4 and verse 11 and 12. Thank God for delivering me. Now let me bring this insight to others. That's all I can pray for. As far as the people that follow this ministry, I think you're seeing it layer by layer. The blinders that Christianity has put on you is no longer a hindrance. You're seeing the truth for what it is, piece by piece. Now, I was going to read more on Muhammad, but I don't want to go any further tonight. Next time, plan to get a lot of history in. I'll get a lot of history in, so bring in your listening ears as we move forward in the series. I want to hear from you now. I want to know if you got it. Play the song.